Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Scottish Learning Festival 2016, organised by Education Scotland and funded by the Scottish Government. The theme, as I'm sure you're aware of this year's festival, is promoting excellence and equity for all. And this theme is, is thoroughly developed during these two days with a programme of keynote lectures, roundtable discussions, professional learning seminars, workshops, and a host of education activities. Not forgetting the largest education exhibition in Scotland with over 100 exhibitors in Hall 4, which includes the local authority village with a focus on attainment this year, the Education Scotland stand where you can find out everything about the new inspection model, a hands-on digital area and exhibitor seminars which are always very popular. Education Scotland is very keen to receive your feedback, your thoughts, your ideas for future events, so please make use of social media using the conference hashtag SLF16. So it's another very busy SLF this year. Before we continue this afternoon, can I ask as a courtesy that everyone ensures their mobile phones are switched to silent? And can I also point out the fire exits within the auditorium? They're at the side and they're also at the back. We're not anticipating any problems, so should an emergency situation arise, an announcement will be repeatedly broadcast and we should leave the building in an orderly manner. Now, it's time for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Zong Zhao. Yong is currently Presidential Chair and Director of the Institute for Global and Online Education in the College of Education at the University of Oregon in the United States. He's also a professor in the Department of Educational Measurement, Policy and Leadership. His work mainly focuses on the implications of globalization and technology on education. He's published over 100 articles and 20 books and is an elected fellow of the International Academy for Education. Originally an English teacher in China, Yong has subsequently contributed to educational issues around the world. And we are very delighted that he's here with us in Glasgow today to discuss fixing the past or inventing the future. Please welcome Dr. Yong Zhao. Well, uh, good morning. I, um, I'm here mainly to apologize on behalf of the US for Donald Trump's behavior. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know, it, you know it's kind of getting scary, really. You know, I know he owns a golf course here, and I'm surprised to still let him in or let the money flow to his uh, headquarters. That's a big issue. I was talking to Andy just now. Andy has an exit strategy. You should talk. I'm talking to you, Andy, after this, too, about this. And uh, I've always really uh, wanted to come to this uh, festival. I like Scotland a lot. And uh, I actually give uh, Scotland my only daughter. Okay. She's now studying at uh, Edinburgh. And uh, she taught me how to speak, uh, say properly, uh, Edinburgh, you know, not Edinburgh, Edinburgh, and stuff like that. So I'm very happy to be here. I was also told that actually, University of Edinburgh prepared the first Western medical doctor for China. That was many, many years ago. So thanks uh, to that preparation, China overconsumes antibiotics today. That was, uh, it's, uh, we never had that before. And uh, so that was uh, many things. And last night, actually, I had a chance to try some uh, uh, local food here. And, uh, and actually, someone took me to a Chinese restaurant instead. I can tell you, it's not authentic in Glasgow. You don't get Glasgow authentic uh, gla and Chinese food here. Don't try it. It's not near as good as your haggis. That's, that's uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, Andy, actually, I'm very proud you know, uh, of you, you for win winning this award as an Englishman. So that shows you still have maintained good relationships with Scotland. Thank you for, for being that. Okay. And now today I want to, this is um, the website. You may be able to download some of the slides uh, I created. And uh, uh, in the kind of in keeping the spirit of uh, being rewarded for numbers, I created a lot of slides, so just in case you know, so you can, I want to use all of them just in case you need to, if you want to tweet, you want to follow, you want to email me, feel free to do any of those things. So that was a very inspiring, actually, uh, speech by your uh, Deputy First Minister. Honestly, I have uh, I've not been to uh, many countries, 
uh, a political leader can actually sing praises of the education system. Like in the US, we most talk about how bad it is, which is a way to justify any action to correct it. So America has been, you know, education has been criticized for a long time. So today it's kind of refreshing to hear someone actually being proud of what you've done and to say you are going to move forward. So that's uh, very refreshing to me. However, today I was, uh, as a title, I was asked to give a title about this talk to say, are we trying to fix the past? Are we trying to invent the future? And I want to just throw some of the general conversations we talk about. Um, number one is what makes a good education system? We've been talking a lot about education systems. And uh, since I was uh, fortunate to be born in, in China and lived in China for a long time and taught in China, and then I've lived in the US for about over 20 years, I've been thinking a lot about what makes a great education. And as you know, right now, where a lot of us are driven by uh, the PISA seems to be defining what good education is, right? And so technically, I come from the best education system in China, and by mistake, I moved to America. You know, was, that, was a, that was a horrible idea. I could have been a default person to explain why China was number one in terms of education. And uh, I'm flipping the slides to show you, I actually prepare a lot of slides for you, okay? But I'm gonna be strategic and choose which one I want to use. So China has been, by the way, I especially been admired by many people, you know, in, in Europe, especially I think in England. And uh, you send a shockwave to China when England tried to uh, import some math teachers from China. I don't know if you, if you know about that. And uh, I don't know if you guys have imported any Chinese math teachers. And I have to tell you, I'm not one of them, okay? You will never import me as a math teacher. I'm the first to admit I'm actually uh, a horrible math person, that's why I moved to America. And that's just, uh, when you are not good in, in, at math in China, it's hard to survive there. So I moved to America, it's okay to, be, to live in America. And just to tell you actually how, how bad my math was, I got three out of 100 in the college entrance exam. If you know math, that's pretty bad. Okay, that, that's really bad. And then I decided to say, okay, if you're bad in math, you can learn English. That's how I, why I decided to learn English in, in a little village school. And then uh, recently I discovered math actually doesn't stop you from doing a lot of interesting things. There's another person whose math is much worse than mine who actually founded the largest internet company now that's called Jack Ma. You know, if you, you know, have you heard about Alibaba? I know the company, one of the largest, you know. Well, you can buy a lot of fake Adidas on it. That, that's basically the, the big, uh, you know. But it's one of the largest company. His, his, uh, his math was uh, one out of uh, 100. So if I had to stop doing that, I could be founding a multi-billion dollar company, you know, in, in that sense. Now, when we talk about education, I was talking about uh, mainly today, you mentioned a lot about the attainment gap. In the US, we call it the achievement gap, you know. And uh, America has been trying to close this thing called achievement gap for a long time. And many of you maybe, I mean, Andy can tell you everything about the achievement gap. However, all our efforts towards achievement gap really has not worked very well. If you look at it, in the US, of course, the achievement gap is right between mainly along racial lines and also income levels. And so for over really 50 years, the gap hasn't been closed. And why is that? Why is that? Why hasn't the gap been closed? To me, I've been analyzing this data for a long time as basically the main thing is that there's, as you mentioned, family reasons, but also that we, we try to close the gap has not worked very well. So we're in talking about two gaps. I call the Eastern Asian education performing very well on the PISA and we have the domestic gap, the international pressure and the domestic pressure. That's trying to force us to change our education. So everybody, I, I would say, every country today is trying to do education reform. However, from my perspective, those reforms are not necessarily addressing what we might need in the future. Today, the big problem is that we have the gap, but also you look at, um, Massive issues of student disengagement. This is the Gallup poll in the US. I don't know about Scotland. All your students must be very well engaged. Unlike America, we only got 30% you know, of kids engaged. And you look at this, this line that keeps dropping. 
the more children come to school, the less engaged they become. That's a big problem. You talk about mental health issues. So look at issues, children not engaged. Children are said to be on the other side of the achievement line. And we also talk about children not being mentally healthy in many places. Actually, we talk a lot about children today, high anxiety, huge pressure, and addicted to themselves. We talk a lot about those things. And we're talking about losing to the global competition to other countries. So there's another problem that we face. I call this the future, what's called youth unemployment. I'm sure you've talked about, even if our children finish the education, 12 years, co finish college, and a lot of them are still not employed. I have, um, I always tell this story of my, of my own children, is that my son went to a school, a college in the US many years ago now, he it's, uh, it's, uh, went to the University of Chicago. He chose to major in economics. If you know any Chinese tradition, Chinese people are only interested in things that can possibly lead to money, okay? So that's why we're doing business, economics, he was gonna be a banker, and uh, after two years of studying there, he decided, said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna study economics anymore, Dad. I said, why? He said, well, there are too many Chinese uh, in economics. And, and uh, I said, that's not a good reason, okay? I said, tell me really why. He said, well, because my math is not as good as theirs. And I said, okay, sure, because that's, in my family tradition, we always try to run away from what you are not good at. I encourage him, I said, just get out of it, you're no good, leave. And uh, I, I, said, I said, what are you gonna study now? He said, I'm gonna study art, art history. And two majors in art and history are not very Chinese thinking. That's right, to, to, to me, it's very hard to explain to my friends why you allow your son to major in art. I said, well, he's bad at math. And that's, remember, that's, I said, uh, so it's, uh, and then he did. And uh, the, at that time, I had one little thing called, I said, uh, you know, as long as you, when you graduate, you do not return to live in my basement. I'll be fine with that. So that's actually one of my definitions of a good education. A good education keeps other people's children out of their basement. And <laughs> if I were in Scottish government, I might put that as a tagline. A Scottish education gets your kids out of your basement, you know. So, so I've been doing that, I've been thinking about that. However, our education has not been able to keep kids out of their parents' basement. This, by the way, is a, is a really a global issue. I look at Australia, that's how youth unemployment hit very high. This was, I think, the, uh, in the, the US, we call youth unemployment is a national crisis. If you look at, here's the UK, I think uh, must include parts of Scotland as well. And developing countries, China, as well as Korea, all of these countries have shown very high youth unemployment. A lot of them actually are very well educated in many ways. If you talk about simple attainment, they have finished college. And in the US actually, uh, in fact, now we have uh, over 53% of our recent college graduates, that's recently five years, are unemployed or underemployed. And it's easy to explain unemployment, but it's very hard to capture underemployment. That is, you have a, a part-time job, or you finish a college degree, but you're working at Starbucks. You know, we got a fancy name called those people baristas, but still, it's not a real good job in many ways, and for those college graduates. And so we have, uh, well, that's why you come to America today, we have the best educated generation of bartenders. It's, it's very, very sad. But that's a big problem, youth unemployment. And so why all of this coming together? You got disengaged kids, unhappy children, you have children, you know, actually not getting jobs when they graduate. And what went wrong with all this process? So for me, I think I would go back to our old education paradigm. The one we're trying to fix. We're trying to make it better. The one we're trying to make it better. If you look at today how we fix education, we're basically fixing three ways. A better curriculum, better teaching, better assessment. That's what we call better, better pedagogy. But is that the way to fix it? How we, how we do it? You know, today, this is what we have. Our children come to our schools. They are very different. And you all know how different children can be, right? They can be different physically. They can be different intellectually. 
They can be different emotionally. That's, I'm only talking about the nature part of it. You know, you're born with different propensities, different capacities. It's always nature via nurture. The nat nurture can enhance or stifle certain of your life possibilities. Now, when these children come to our school, they're beautiful, they're different, and the difference itself does not carry any value. But once you put them in a school, in a culture, in a specific task, we began to judge the differences. Some differences are good, others are bad. Some are good, others are bad. With specific tasks, for example, with the, let's say if you want to play sports, any kind of rugby, okay, let's say rugby, you know, in the, uh, Amer American football, that would be a good thing, you know. And Andy may be able to win this award, but put Andy on the rugby field, that would not be, I don't know, Andy, how many kind of goals you can win, but that's, uh, for me, I would never try. Soccer, that's different, right? So I would never try to be a 300-pound rugby player. Do you see what I mean? So that's really bad. But if you put a big rugby player to on the balance beam to do gymnastics, that may not work very well. So we have those differences, but we make judgment because the utility of those differences. And this is, of course, is one type of differences. If you look at, uh, we have differences in other domains and uh, talk about talents. You know, we have to think that people are born with different potentials, different propensities, different talents. This is just one model of talking about how we are born differently. This is the, the Howard Gardner model talking about difference, that we might be born with different talents. Different talents simply means if you happen to have talent in that area, you can learn in that area faster and reach a higher level. And everybody, if we, without talent, you can still learn the basics. Right? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you cannot learn. Everybody can learn, but how fast and how far can you go makes a difference. For example, if given enough time, enough practice, good teaching, we all can learn to paint. But not every one of us can become a Picasso. Not every one of us can pick. And the same way, I can learn to swim, but it will be very hard for me to become a Michael Phelps. It's a, there is certain things that behind it. So, so this thing, when you bring our children to our schools, there are differences. But how valuable are their differences? And how well can we develop depends on what schools can do. You know, all of this, you can have the capacity, but if you are not provided the opportunity, you may not even be able to know you have that talent. You know, I've been, again, joking about this. I said I could have become a Justin Bieber, but I never had access to music when I was growing up in a Chinese village. So I would never even know if I had, could become a singer. And today, if I sing, and my daughter just says, Dad, please stop. You know, that, that, that's, uh, I don't even get a chance to try that. So that's, uh, it's very crashy, but I'm happy not to try it you know, as either. And so with, with this thing, you know, we talk about are you investing in your, the area you might be good or area you're not. And also if you're born, you know, you have the talent, if you're not given the opportunity or not being able to try something, you know, to learn that, you will not become very good at that, you know, they, Malcolm Gladwell spread this myth, actually it's kind of almost true, psychologically speaking, called 10,000 hours, you know. And it doesn't have to be 10,000 hours, can be 9,000, 8,000, or 11,000 hours. It basically means if you want to be good at something, effort matters. You know? But now, in life, we don't have many 10,000 hours for everything. So if you spend 10,000 hours on one thing, you won't be spent 10,000 hours on something else. So there is a trade-off choice, you know. What do you spend time on? Do you spend time on something you might be good at or not good at? So for me, very early on, I kind of ran away. I ran away from my weaknesses. You know, I was, uh, one thing, I was, I was born in this little house like this in Sichuan province in China. In my village, the most valued skill at that time was to drive the water buffalo. So that was the core skills of being successful in the village. And I was no good at that at all. And so my father basically said, why don't you go to school? You know, just, you know, you're, you're wasting the time here doing, trying to be a farm boy. And that's what I did. I gave up. And I'm glad he did not give me remedial lessons, you know. And, 
He could have done that, right? Could have done. If I, I did that, I would have become the, the worst Chinese peasant, you know. So I was, uh, I was kind of basically, I said, I'm not going to spend 10,000 hours on that. I can't spend 10,000 hours on that. So I went to school. So that's kind of, you know, uh, and how, as I told you, my family, we, we quit. We quit in front of weaknesses. We can't, we're no good. So we try to do something else. And this, again, does not mean you cannot learn. How much and how fast you can learn matters. And schools, naturally, make a choice. I mean, make, make a, a decision. When we prescribe any curriculum, we are deciding what opportunities we shall give to children. We are deciding what matters at, at given times. When we talk about this uh, uh, achievement gap in the U.S., we're also defining what counts as achievement, what doesn't count as achievement. So we're making decisions. Curriculum, in essence, on the one hand, is, can be opportunities, but at the same time, is a value judgment, is what we would like to have, th those value judgments. The same thing that our children are different from motivational perspective, that we are motivated differently. And this is uh, uh, Stephen Rice, actually a, a psychologist, came up with this called 16 Basic Human mo Motivators. And uh, I don't know, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, 16 of them. He talks about how we are not motivated by the same thing. We have a different motivational profile. And so this captures all human beings are motivated by one of this or two of this. It, you know, what matters to you? And uh, you can see this. I have, okay. I have, all right. You can see it now. So some people, for example, are extremely motivated by the idea of power. They want to influence others. When I say you're born to be motivated by this, it basically means that's what we call the source of passion. When you get to do what you're born to, you know, to do, you actually, it's effortless, you get energy, you enjoy doing it. Again, you can always be forced not to do this. And in that case, it will be very effortful, and you may hate it, but for other reasons, you may actually give up on this. So some people are extremely kind of rainy, trying to seek influence. I applaud really all those political leaders. They, they really, I mean, look at uh, actually the worst one would be J. Edgar Hoover, would be the one who was really driven by power, don't influence others. And uh, even look at the, the again, the US um, presidential election. Look at those people. I mean, Bernie Sanders, if I were Bernie Sanders, I would never try to do what he did. You know, just it's too much work. And if I'm 70 year old, I'd rather sit in there sinking some scotch. And I would never try to do any of those, those things. It's, uh, but they are motivated. They like it. They enjoy doing that. And, and some people are much more curious. And as educators, as teachers, we all want our children to be equally curious. But we know actually that's not true. Not all children are equally curious about things. In your class, you will always find some children always want to know why, what's going on, right? And uh, if you put anything new, they want to know, why did you do that? Other kids may just be completely, you know, oblivion to what, what happened there. The same thing with uh, power. If you get 10 kids in your family, in your school, one of them will want to be the boss, remember? That? And the others happen to say, I'm going to follow. Remember that those kind of things happens all the time. You know, look at the, some people are very much into the idea of order. Have you run into people who, are, who absolutely lo loves organizing your closet and they come, come to your house and organize everything? The pencils have to be in order. Have you seen those? those? If you put a coffee cup on the wrong side, they get really upset in with you. And those are the people who, who color codes everything. I'm the one who just can't anti that. You know, whenever my wife comes to tell me to put my books on my shelf, I said, it's really hard. She takes two seconds. I said, two seconds is too much for me. It's just, you know, and just don't come to my office. I'll be fine with that. It just, you know. The, the, you go all through this process. Some people into saving things. Others into, that's a social contact, family, tranquility, physical activity. By the way, if you accept that we are different and motivated, we seek different goals, you understand why people really take different actions. You know, the, uh, just like physical activity. Until I read this theory, I really could not under, understand and why Andy would torture himself of walking 500 miles. You know, it's, uh, uh, I live in the, I, I used to live in actually uh, Oregon, uh, Eugene. Oh, by the way, a, a little correction I gave uh, Heather, an outdated bio. I have, uh, I had moved into University of Kansas since uh, last month. 
just trying to see if I can turn that red state into blue. That was the, the main reason to, to go there. But anyway, so when I lived in Oregon, uh, there was a, uh, we were the birthplace of Nike. So I used to walk, watching people. They kept running around. That's really one interesting thing to watch you know, as someone from a village. And, you know, in my village, we run for a purpose. You run towards something good, away from something bad. But now in Oregon, people wearing expensive shoes, they just run around in the park, okay? And that's something I said, I don't get it. Why? And people pay expensive uh, membership fees to drive to a gym and find the closest parking spot walking and to run around. You know, as a, as, so why do you do that? People like to exhaust themselves. It's expensive ADHD kids. You know, some people, when they get tired, they say, I'm going to take a walk. When you get tired, I, say, I normally I would say, done. You know, why, why would you? And I'm going to run. People run to gain energy. You know, so this is actually, for me, explains a lot of things to me. Honestly, it's just really about called diversity. Now, with all this diversity of children, our traditional education did not really appreciate this diversity. Because education has always had the purpose of trying to produce one or two types of individuals. You know, so we look at the society. Well, that's how we construct curriculum. We say, what does the society need? And we make a good guess of the curriculum. So you look at our society, a tradition, we look at this. What do all our citizens will need? That's our approach. We look at what, our, what they might need. And uh, it looks like uh, the slide is cutting half off. You know, it's rainy. Okay, this one is not. So we, we try to construct something. We always, like in America, we say, okay, in order for you to be ready for career and college, for work to be successful, you need English language arts and math. We call it literacy and numeracy, you know. And, and by the way, in America, I never understood uh, why America on the achievement gap thinks literacy is the most important thing. In America, as a developed country, achieve literacy, so-called literacy a long time ago, almost universal literacy, so I always blamed George Bush. You know, no child left behind. George Bush found it hard to read, and he made that a personal problem into a national problem. That was the, that, that was the, the big challenge. So now we began to pour a lot of money to solve the literacy problem. What's well, really just interesting, just, uh, you know, so political leaders should never think about, you know, kind of nationalize your personal issues. And, but, but anyway, the, this is how we used to think about a curriculum. We look at what society needs, then we make a decision what we have. PISA does the same thing, right? PISA said, we think you need reading, math, and science. That's where we're doing this whole thing. So we construct, we make a guess. So someone said, maybe not. Maybe we need uh, uh, to add uh, uh, social studies. You know, all people are trying to say, oh, well, let's add collaborative thinking. Remember adding all those things to say, these are the skills required of all children and all teachers have to teach all of them to these people. Remember I talked about individual differences? We actually don't care about that. We care about the outcome, what we want to give you. And this is, again, content driven, but now you have new ones coming up to say, talk about um, 21st century skills. You heard about this term? You know, we're almost 23rd century, but we are still like, you know, 21st century. You heard about that. They're called four C's. Have you heard about the four C's? Oh, it's called critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. By the way, some people have added, you know, make it six C's now. Okay. I think Michael has eight C's, right? Michael Fuller has how many? Six C's. Okay. It's really interesting. The people have, I thank God English has a lot of words with C's. I'm, I'm really happy for you guys, you know. And, and uh, you, you, may, uh, you, you may have uh, like 11 C's coming up, you know. So, but that, that is still the same mentality. We want the four C's for everybody. Remember the, those things? We talk about the, let's say four C's. How about we're going to get four C's, you know, for everybody. You know, this is called four C's. And then some people say, oh, no, no, it's not really the C's. It's really what they call IQ or EQ. Have you, you read those books, right? Called IQ maybe only 20% now. We got 80% EQ. You know, how about 79%? Would that work as well? You know, and, uh, and so I talked to my, my father. My father is kind of a, he's an old man. He's illiterate. He's in my village. He, he's the one who did not attempt to remediate me. Remediate me. He said, you know, I was asking him, I said, what makes a successful person? He said, you know, I, saw, I, saw, I explained to him what IQ is. Remember, he's illiterate. It's a Chinese. Uh, what IQ is, what EQ is. He actually said something very smart. He said, you know, I would put some feng shui into that. Seriously, I, not, not joking. It's just, uh, he said feng shui actually matters. It's randomness. It's, uh, and uh, by the way, he actually uh, credits 
whatever I do with where he buried my father, nothing to do with me. You know, his father mattered a lot. My grandfather determined what I would do today. It was really an interesting uh, theory. But if you look, almost any kind of writing curriculum is about a prescription of a profile of skills and knowledge for individuals to succeed. And we expect every individual to achieve the same for those jobs. I call it homogeneous prescription of this. And no matter how many you add, no matter what you add, so in essence, we ignore all of these uh, individual differences and try to turn our children from a diversity of individuals into what I call a workforce or citizens. And this is their traditional curriculum approach that is very much about change our children into their prescribed outcomes. I don't know why we're cutting off some kind of something here, but you can read it. You know, it's, that's called individual difference. We ignore of this. We turn them into a prescribed outcome. So that's what we've been trying to improve our education by curriculum. We change our curriculum. Then we help our teachers to have better pedagogy to turn them all into this process. And this is, by the way, I call this a, a sausage-making model, a process. You guys have, or haggis making, whatever you can think about. It's, uh, and uh, it is, you take all these different types of individuals, we ignore them. If they happen to be, if they happen to be strong in the areas we want them to be strong, they become our good students. They're on the top side of our achievement gap. If they are not, for family reasons or individual passion reasons, all those reasons, they're on the other side. That, that's basically what, what we have on the, in this one. And then when we make this judgment, of course you lose students. If they come to school in America, as one of the things we know, uh, trying to fix uh, achievement gap, one of the things we said, okay, you must be able to read by third grade or by something. And those who are not good at reading, the families cannot provide the environment. They've been provided extended remedial sessions and they've been deprived of opportunities to a broad curriculum, to recess, to PE, to other things. And when you are being fixed all the time, it's very likely you want to be disengaged. You don't really enjoy that process very much. And at the same time, you may have other talents, but that talents are not recognized. You know, so we try to fix this, uh, this people, fix their deficit. I was talking about Michael Phelps. Like, it's kind of true. If we had tried to fix Michael Phelps' reading before he could go swim, what would have happened? The poor guy would not be an Olympic you know, kind of gold medalist. He would still be hooked on phonics in some basement. He would have still not going very far with that, that, that idea. So when you fix someone, but this is the model we want. But remember, in a traditional society, we look at jobs like this, or jobs like this, or jobs like this, jobs like this, we could prescribe, really, we could prescribe a profile of knowledge and skills that make you successful in those jobs. And those skills we required of this, we had no expectation of you to be great or exceptional. In this kind of jobs, we require people to be mediocre. So this, we don't care about your individual passion, talent, interest. You actually can't get there. You're, you can force to do this kind of jobs. I and mean, this, we require no exceptionality. Lady Gaga would be useless here. I mean, you would, would be most useless. So that was the model we had in education. However, that model, remember I said, if you want to fix people, people get disengaged. And traditionally, if you were disengaged, we can still force you to master basics. And when you fix people, people are generally, generally be comply with that. And even though they may not become great, they still had a job prospect. However, that model is gone, basically, today. We remember we talk about the youth unemployment. There are many reasons for youth unemployment. One of the biggest reasons is technology. That is uh, the big shift. Everybody recognizes this. Now you have jobs like this. Now you have uh, jobs gone. This is just one very strong illustration. Uber just delivered its first driverless taxis in Pittsburgh last week. You know. Can you imagine how many drivers will be replaced? And that's coming very quickly. And we don't need human drivers. Think about other jobs that will be gone. Driver's license, okay? You don't need to go driver's education, driver's license, authorities, 
insurance companies and uh, police. You have nobody to arrest. You can drink as much as you want. You know, I, I, if I, I, I actually predict that creates a great opportunity for scotch makers. You know, it's going to drive up the consumption. It's, it's, it's going to go up. You know, it's the, so that's the, and I, when I go through immigration different places. If you go to a lot of countries, machines have replaced immigration officers. And if you go, accountants have been replaced. You know, you, you know look at around. This is what we, somebody is calling this then the second machine age. The second machine age, which is really kind of comparable to this. The first machine age created by steam engines. And I was reading the biography of one of your greatest contributions from Scotland to America is Carnegie, uh, Andrew Carnegie. It was interesting. His family left because of they were doing weaving, kind of, then textile industry come in, very displaced. That's the time we are probably reaching another time of rethinking about a big revolution. Second machine age, or well, somebody actually is now talking about the fourth industrial revolution as well. <laughs> when we have a revolution, when we have a revolution, things change. So here's what I want to come to talk about. I know uh, Carol, uh, this afternoon, talk a lot about the evidence. But when, some, when a revolution happens, past evidence may not work. You know, when you have a, you know, evidence works within one paradigm, but once we reach a revolution, past prediction may not work. It's the same thing, you know, if you were uh, living in the Stone Age and, and you are moving towards the Bronze Age, the skills in dealing with stones may not work well with copper. You know, over, but, you know, we, you also have heard of this thing called uh, the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. Yeah. And uh, the, we, have, we are seeing big revolution here. And what's this revolution about? And this is actually, if you look at the revolution changes, very simple, first and second industrial revolution, you know, electricity, steam engine, massive, massive employment jobs coming up, and new revolution comes in, we just redefine how we work, how we think. And just as, as think about evidence, you know, I got to pay tribute to my, my uh, Chinese farming kind of uh, a tradition. How, when paradigm shifts, how past evidence stops working, and let's think about this uh, story. This story is a fabricated story. Most of my stories are real. This one is not. Okay. And uh, just imagine that my, uh, my father buys a chicken. Okay. Uh, but imagine you are the chicken. Okay. You, so you try to fight, figure out, collect evidence when you might be fed. Oh, it's a good story. You, know, you want to know. You want to know. You cannot rely on this. So the chicken goes to knock on the door of my father's at 7 o'clock in the morning, first day. And the chicken gets fed. That's evidence piece, number one. Data point one, you got that, right? So, so the second day goes to get fed. And the third day, fourth day. If you can plot 300 days, that's pretty cool, pretty reliable evidence. Then you want to go again. Tomorrow, of course, you rely on that. It's a very high probability. You'll get fed until the Chinese festival comes, spring festival comes. And then people decide to eat the chicken. So you go there at 7 o'clock, you go there, all your past data evidence disappears, you know. You get, you get caught and get killed, and you become dinner. And that's the, that, so but when, when we revolution happens, we got to rethink about new paradigms. And this is really nothing new, but revolution doesn't happen all the time. And this is from um, Richard Florida's data, talking about how you look at the revolutions. Those cliffs are revolution. This is the distribution of the workforce over the last 200 years in, in the U.S. Actually, it's talking about how the green line of farming and fishing jobs disappeared. And then we become, you look at 1850s, 1820s, that's sharp decline. And then we have the rise of the employment, the working class, people working for other people. That becomes the rise. And that begins to change around the th uh, 1950s, 1970s. That's the, called the third industrial revolution, which powered by you know, microcomputer chips, like robotics, all those kind of things. And now they're talking about the fourth one, just right now it's really smart machines, artificial intelligence, network of everything. You, know, you can talk to your, your, uh, your refrigerator, refrigerator talks to your coffee maker, you know, those kind of things. It's smart machines, the age of smart machines. And you know today the best Jeopardy player is a computer. The best chess player is a computer. The, you know, so those things are solving big problems now. In the age of smart machines, of course, 
our education has to shift. Because education was, in essence, preparing, as I said before, preparing people to do a lot of mechanical jobs. Those jobs that can be done by machines, and those jobs now are replaced. It's like this. It's what, imagine we were producing workers like this, and now those jobs are gone. What can we do now? So the question I think you know, for us about the future is, to, are we able to reinvent an education that fits the future, that imagine smart machines? So what can we do as human beings to deal with smart machines? I like to look at uh, opportunities. Whenever this kind of revolution happens, it always creates opportunities. As I mentioned before, the driverless car, a car that does not require a human driver, would displace a lot of human beings, but at the same time, create new opportunities, not only for scotch makers. They're only, you know, imagine, actually, I'm imagining a, a new profession that's gonna be really important. It's called car interior designers. Right now, you know, all the cars designed Really boring, right? Because now in the future, you can put a hot tub in the car, a bar in the car. Imagine all those things. Imagine a movie theater in the, it's just amazing, right? Just, I think for teachers, you should be very happy. You get an extra hour driving to school, you can brush your teeth on your way, you know? Just, it's, just imagine all those new ways of doing business. So look at opportunities, what can happen. Again, remember, we, our original paradigm is to prescribe what you need, we imagine this will be success needed for success in life. Then we require our schools to do that. Then we pass assessment to judge if you have met that goal in a certain time, in all, all the way. Now in the future, when you cannot predict what might need, and we may have to shift rethinking about. So that, that what helps in rethinking is both my own experience as a useless Chinese peasant who left, so I always tell people, so how the useless have become useful is the first lesson we need to learn, okay? So I'm a good example, but a better example is, uh, is actually Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. Do you know Rudolph? Okay, that's a really good example to think about. Rudolph, remember his nose was too red, did not meet the government requirement or standard of, of being black, you know, that was, uh, so he was, nobody wants to play with him, right? Couldn't get into any college, was put into special education to fix his nose, remember those things, you know, and didn't chant, didn't work. But until one foggy Christmas Eve, <laughs> and, and Santa Claus was looking for a, 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 a GPS, or you call Tom Tom, right? And it just, uh, and then and Rudolph said, hey, I'm pretty cool for that, right? And so that's the, Good story of how they use this, become useful. A foggy Christmas Eve is a trigger. Okay, that's trigger it. Another good story, I don't know if you know this person, but we, every American knows, uh, is uh, another useless person who becomes useful is Kim Kardashian. Do, do you know Kim Kardashian? Okay, and, and uh, well, I can show you the picture of her, her. It's hard to find the one that's good for you guys, but anyway, so it's, uh, it's uh, often, very, very hard, I mean, it's actually hard to find when she has clothes on, but anyway, that's, uh, 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 but anyway, so many people argue with me, say, how is she useful? She's practically useless, right? So she belongs to a, she belongs to a class of people I call, the new class is called celebrities for nothing. And, and by the Andy and I, we actually met her once in, in, Mel, in Melbourne, right? Andy, remember that? And uh, it was, was in the elevator right? in, by the uh, Crown Casino. We met her, and we were kind of almost kicked out. So Kim is here. We got lots of people, young kids in the lobby. So I asked, we, I asked those kids, what are you guys doing? He said, we're waiting for Kim. And I said, who is Kim? I didn't know who Kim was, but, you know, Andy apparently knows better. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, uh, 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 I ask it, and uh, actually I ask my daughter later on. She, uh, uh, my daughter knows a lot about the pop culture stuff. She's, uh, so she's, she's kind of served by pop culture consultant. I said, so who is this Kim person? Why are people following her? My daughter said, well, that must be Kim Kardashian, and uh, she's a celebrity. I said, celebrity for what? She said, nothing. You know? and, uh, and now you can. You know? So celebrity for nothing are those people who are basically famous for being well known. That, that, that's, that's basically who they are. But funny thing. She is not in her parents' basement. <laughs> so I've been traced, I've been studying this class of people. What create the, their so-called value? Okay, here comes this thing. This, um, when technology changes, what do we get in society, this new revolution? We have a rise in productivity. 
Reason productivity gives us what? Two things. More leisure time and more disposable income for all developed countries. Remember, more leisure time, more disposable income, so you do not have to spend all your time, all your effort, securing necessities for physical survival, like my father would have. He has spent all the time, you know, securing the food, shelter, and clothing. So now today, in a new society, like you, I know your teachers are not paid enough, you work too hard, but still, compared to people in my village, you have a lot more leisure time, a lot more disposable income. Once you have that, this is Daniel Pink calls the age of abundance. And once you have that, you begin to consume very different products and services. You think about education, health, entertainment. So you are talking about your psychological needs, spiritual needs, aesthetic needs, intellectual needs. It's very different now. So I bet in most developed countries, my trace was that 100 years ago in the US, people spend over 80% of their income on necessities. Today, it's less than 50%. So you win all this time and money, what do you do? You worry about your psychological satisfaction. And psychological, intellectual are extremely personal. And personalized consumption creates diversity. Your need for diversity changes. We con everything we consume now has to be diverse. So therefore, the largest commodity of everything we consume is called a choice. Everything has to consume a lot of choice. So just to show you the story about a choice. Remember I told you, I came, I, I went to the US in 1992, came out of a society of necessity, and then went to America. So this is what I had to wash myself, okay. A bar, let's talk about this advanced version already. This is 1980s, 1990s. A bar of soap for everything, okay, it was fine. Then I went to America, first day, 1992, tried to buy something to wash my hair. I couldn't buy it because I did not know what kind of hair I had. <laughs> you, you, you have to know. You, you know that, right? It's serious stuff. It's still a traumatizing experience for me right now. You have to know I use your hair oily, normal, or dry. Remember those? That, that's the basic, and you can add some more other variations there. So I look, I said, what am I gonna do with this? And I, imagine from this to this, and you wanna study, okay, for how serious are those choices? You don't know. And then you say, okay, maybe I can say, okay, I, I'm dry, but I dry hair, and then, I don't know if I am, but still don't know, but now. Uh, but you wanna ask a question, just talk to anybody who I'm an age of necessity. Does the color of the bottle matter? To me, it's a serious question. How about I'm buying the wrong color? You know, what, what, what's going to, does the shape of the bottle, ma uh, bottle matter? You probably say no. But if I reduce all of this into one generic plastic bag, would you like it? You don't. You want, you want this thing. So this is called diversity. How do you create choices? Today, everybody creates choices. So Kim Kardashian becomes valuable because she's just like a strange bottle of shampoo. In many ways, a very small, it's called personalized consumption, or we call this narrow casting, no more broadcasting, everything has to be personalized, you like it. She appeals to a very small group of individuals, but that group, because of globalization, the base becomes huge because of technology. So even one out of 10,000 people likes her, that's a lot of people because of globalization. So today, no matter where you are, if you have talent, if you can reach a lot of people, any kind of choice you create can become very valuable in that sense. Globalization and technology creates new opportunities, so the useless has become useful. But also look at across this whole line of things. Just to make shampoo, did you notice that almost Every talent in this so-called multiple intelligences will has become valuable. The scientist, people who like nature, can go look for new ways to wash your hair, new ways. The ones, the artist, can design different bottles, different colors. The one who has music talent, they can sing. Because have you seen a bottle of shampoo sold without someone singing, dancing with it in the TV? You know, you've seen those, right? And, and you have people who love to talk to other people. And those are people who come to your door to convince you why you need to buy this thing, right? People who love to organize has a job. You know, everybody, in essence, has become valuable. So what I think the new model of education, the first thing is to recognize 
that if Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. We have to redefine what's value, valuable talent. We cannot just go make a prejudgment about what's valuable, what's not valuable. So I want to go back to the first idea that it's very important to think that every talent is valuable, deserves to be developed. This actually has been advanced by, um, by uh, Todd Rose out of, uh, out of uh, Harvard, wrote a book called The End of Average. And uh, talks a lot about how we succeed with a jagged profile, not an even profile of every talent. It's not about you cannot be good at everything. You have to make a choice. Actually, look around yourself. Some of you, you have to admit you're not good at something. And this is why sometimes I said, if you think you're good at everything, you're just wrong. Or that's why sometimes so-called growth mindset is simple stupidity. You know, you just you spend time doing stuff which is of no value of, of this thing. You have to help with this. Admit, accept the idea of called, uh, you know, sometimes not everything can go together. Which leads me to the second point when we think about education. is what I call side effects of education. Okay, ed side effects. You know, when you go by medicine, by Tylenol, all of those things, and uh, there's always a warning label. I don't know if you paid attention to those warning labels. Have you paid attention? And it always says that uh, uh, if this may um, cure your headache uh, or runny nose, but may uh, cause a bleeding stomach. You should read those warning labels. That's medical lesson number, uh, number one. Have you ever received anything like that in education policy, program, teaching methods? Have anyone told you this thing? You know, for example, they tell you, but, you know, you know one, one example would be say, okay, uh, this reading program may, may improve your children's reading ability or decoding ability, but may cause them to hate reading forever. <laughs> have, you, have you seen those? those, those? Have, you, have you seen those? You, you haven't, right? Okay. So here are some, some, I've been tracking down these ideas. When you are fixing something, when you are thinking we're helping you improve fixing something, what are the side effects? So I've been looking at them. I started by talking about PISA, okay? So look at them, the, the top scoring countries. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been talking to past. I said, Finland never declined. You just have more Asian countries taking the test. And, and no, I will, PISA is going to be released in December again. Okay, it's December again. I think it's going to be, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I would bet Chinese students will not be bad even on the cre cre creativity part of it. Because it's a test. Creativity is a test. It's still a test. As long as a test, we Chinese got mastered, okay? Don't worry about it. If you want ever top Chinese in t test taken, you have no hope. Don't even try that, okay? We will be number one for a long time, okay? We practiced for 2,000 years, guys, you know? So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, even before you, you thought about this, then we've been testing people. So, and we, we score very high. Do you notice that all the East Asian countries? All these Confucian culture countries in, have done impure exam for a long time. We know how to do this, okay? Now, there's the top scoring counts. So when these scores were released, Western countries always get into panic mode. Said, oh my God, we're gonna be behind. I tell you, you've been behind for hundreds of years. Don't worry about that. This is not the first time. It's a, it's a, why do you get nervous about this? It's the same thing like in America. America always says, you know, our education is in decline, it's getting worse, therefore we got to change. I said, no. If you look at any of the data, American education is not in decline, it's not getting worse, it has always been bad. <laughs> it's been bad for a long time. If you look at any of the test scores, you know, and Britain, by the way, UK has always been bad in t test scores compared to Asian countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, all those teams, PISA, everything. It's American, like 1964. 1964, US students, 12th graders, ranked 12th out of 12 countries. Remember, th that's bad, again, if you know math. That's, that's bad in math, it's, uh, and, and now you look at, he said, what? When did you have a good time? Like, like, like Donald Trump, make America great again. When was it great anyway? And it just, it's a, the, no. But at the same time, I've been looking at that. I said, let's look at the data. Look at data in a different way. Education is not about producing good scores. Education is about producing good citizens, good workers, innovative, creative individuals. So if the scores indeed mattered as a measure of quality of these individuals, America should not be here. Do you notice that? 1964. If it's so bad, somebody else should have, have taken over. So 
America so far is still here until Trump takes over, but, in, but it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's still here. So why, I have this question, actually really, a lot of my research to this question is, why is America, U.S. still here? I know the Canadians always want to know, you guys want to know, why are you guys still down there? You know, it's, it's, why is here? So I look at the, the test scores on the other side, side effects. And uh, I look at one indicator. PISA and TIMS all measure this, called affective domain questions. Affective domain. That is, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Do, are you confident? Do you like this, the kind of things? So look, as, you know, American students have always scored below Asian countries. But then if you look at confidence, American students, they're stupid, but they're really confident. <laughs> it's a, so they outconfident everybody. And then if you look at examine the score, uh, the, the, the actually the patterns across, it's always like this, TIMS data. 2003 TIMS data, that is, countries producing students with higher scores have lower confidence, lower engagement. Okay, so now do what, what, do you, what do you prefer? Okay, this is called side effect. What do you want? And this is not one time. This is not one time. You look at uh, scores 2011. Eight years later, again, TIMS data. Uh, I just picked a few countries here, okay. Uh, Top scoring countries versus low scoring English in Anglo-Saxon countries, which I call this the a contrast between uh, chopsticks and forks. If you use chopstick, you score very well, but you're not very confident. That's you know, look at all the chopstick uh, using countries. That's uh, that's how the difference there. And they look at the confidence and do uh, value math. So this side effects recently has been borne out in how some new psychological studies, and that came out. Um, I'm trying to find this study. There are two studies came out of MIT and uh, uh, UC Berkeley. Basically, they're playing the idea called direct instruction versus exploration. Direct instruction versus exploration. The two studies, they gave children, four-year-old children, toys to play. One is free play. Said, well, play with this new toy, whatever you find, and let me know when you're done, and tell me, you know, how different new ways you find how to play with the toy. Another one is about direct instruction, said, look at me, this is my toy, I'm gonna show you how to play with the toy, instruction. If you measure how fast, how much they learn to play the toy, direct teaching works. But in that direct teaching group, those children showed much less curiosity, much less creativity, played with the toy, the toy much shorter time, they're just not interested anymore. So what are you looking for in terms of uh, what are we getting? So long-term sacrifice, long-term gains versus short-term gains, and what, what are you looking for? So that's another thing. When you look what we could damage, what we could be wanting, so I wrote a book about this called Counting What Counts recently, and one of the chapters I explored the idea about how instructional outcomes might interfere with educational outcomes. I call creativity, curiosity, all the other, other capacities, entrepreneur thinking, confidence as long-term outcomes. So if you are helping children, when you make them learn something, they hate it, how do you like that? Actually, Hong Kong was number one in reading on PERS data. Their children rank lowest in motivation to read. And so would you like that or you are something different? This is, and actually I'm gonna go back to another thing that we talk about creativity. Creativity has been, Talk everywhere, everybody loves creativity. But how are we doing with creative kids? Do we really like creativity? Creative is actually a natural born human attribute. Okay, everybody is creative, you don't teach it. And creativity, I always say creativity cannot be taught, but it can be killed. And very often we kill creativity. So there's some, um, one set of data shows that uh, age five, our children, this is from 1970s data, uh, American students, okay. Um, 98% of children are creative at the genius level. Five years later, in our schools, in our, not in your schools, in American schools, you guys don't do this, okay. It's American schools get rid of about, about 60 some percent of creative children at the genius level. Then this continue to decline as they reach middle school. Age 15, 10% are left, and we continue to decline until about age 44, 2% left, and after retirement, creativity bounces back. 
That's why George Bush is pending now. You know, just, uh, you know, just quit, give us hope. You know, if you can regain it, you can regain it. I'm sure you guys can. And, and actually, this actually prompts creativity researchers to rethink. Creativity is not a necessarily cognitive. It has more to do with psychological. Do you feel like you can be creative? So you can regain, you never lose it. But do you allow yourself to be creative, to think differently? Now imagine a class in a school system, that why Asian systems have always suffered from this. And let's look at the PISA data the same way, about entrepreneurship and creativity. This is the PISA data I was able to get out, correlation. It's all negative. PISA reading, science, and math. This is across countries. Countries with high PISA rankings have lower entrepreneurship confidence, lower entrepreneurship activities. So education, in many ways today, if you want to really think about education, take advantage of the opportunities technology has created for us. In the future, we have to admit, we have to let machines do what machines do the best. Human beings have to shift. So we have to become more human. Become more human basically means, I think number one, human beings can identify problems. So I would value the ability to identify problems worth solving more than pro solving problems. Today we talk about solving problems. We can let others to solve the problems, identifying problems. And are we helping our children to think about their unique talent to identify problems worth solving? Are we helping our children to help to create values for others? That's called entrepreneurial thinking. Are we helping them create values create jobs for themselves and for other people. So, in my mind, we have to ditch the idea. We have to abandon the old paradigm of education, of trying to prescribe what makes someone successful. Instead, look at the different opportunities. You know, I was showing you that this, this data that talks about um, uh, how the useless, I gotta show you one piece of things that is, uh, how dyslexia becomes a talent. Dyslexia in interferes with reading and other cognitive functions. You know, we can fix people, help make sure they can read, but now today new research shows that dyslexic individuals are talented with images. They can be good artists, video game designers, or they can become good phys uh, astrophysicists. So do you want to fix them? Or, but a 100 years ago, those talents were really, literally, not very valuable. But today, do you guys know everything has become art? today. I mean, even food has become art. That's why, you know, the more amount you pay, the less food you get. That, that's, that's the reason. It's a, because it's an art experience. You want to enjoy that. So I want to shift back to rethink about the idea. How do we help every student become great in their own way? How do we create opportunities for individuals, not for a group? We have to shift our thinking. We are life coaches. We don't fix children, we don't prescribe on them, we shift to a different education model that enhances individual talent. The, I, I like your, your uh, deputy ministers talk about get it right for everyone, but that everyone is to follow them. The curriculum, the education experience follows the child and we engage them, this is what a new model I would say, enough student autonomy. Children have sufficient voice and choice in the curriculum Children, teachers, shifting from teaching to support learning. We're more of educator than simply a teacher. We engage our children in authentic product making, in identify problems worth solving, and we do so on a globalized campus. We can learn from other people, with other people, and for other people. So if anything, you know, by the way, I don't want to sell you my book, too. And this is a, this, that's the book I wrote about those ideas. So just to bring everything back, get everything right, solve that 10-minute gap and the, the issue. Everything has to think, rethink about education. We do not prescribe something. We support every individual. If every individual child is inspired, can become great, learn to identify problems, learn to create value for other people, and think globally, they will stay out of our basement and yours. Thank you. Thank you.
very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Yong, for a, a truly inspiring uh, keynote. I think so many of those messages around globalization and technology in destinations are vitally important for us in Scotland as we move forward with developing Scotland's young workforce in particular and continuing to improve the, uh, our curriculum for excellence. So once again, everybody, thank you very much to Dr. Yong Zhao. Thank you.